Does the Bible say the earth is 6,000 years old? That's a really good question that people argue about a lot. To dive in, we need to go back to 1650. This is James Usher. He was the Archbishop of Armagh and primate of all Ireland. No, not that kind of primate. In 1650, after carefully counting the generations of the genealogies, calculating the dates of the deaths of Alexander the Great and Nebuchadnezzar, and tacking on a week for the seven-day creation story in Genesis 1, Usher concluded that God began creating the universe in 4004 BC on October 22nd. Yes, it was very specific. Usher wasn't alone in trying to work out the math of creation. In the years following the Reformation, thinkers as notable as Sir Isaac Newton devoted themselves to applying their new scientific thinking to the interpretation of the Bible. Key to Usher's calculations, of course, was his assumption that Genesis 1 was a literal scientific account of God creating everything in the universe from nothing in six 24-hour days. Up until the 1800s, there wasn't much reason to question Usher's math or his assumptions. But as the science of geology developed in the late 18th and early 19th centuries, growing evidence seemed to suggest an Earth older than a few thousand years, much, much older. Hey. Belief in a young earth began to fade away, even among Christians. By the 1920s, at the peak of the battle between fundamentalist and modernist Christians over the reliability of the Bible, amazingly, almost no one on either side still held to a young earth position. The most popular Bible study resource at the time, the Schofield Reference Bible, promoted gap theory, the theory that millions of years of geological history could be hidden between the first and second verses of Genesis 1. When conservative Christians attempted to define all the fundamentals of Christianity in a series of early 20th century pamphlets called, appropriately, The Fundamentals, Darwinian evolution was explicitly rejected. And Old Earth, however, was not, as several theories had developed to account for how millions of years might fit into Genesis 1. Then we get to the 1960s and the emergence of modern young earth creationism. Aggressively spread through publishing, homeschooling, and even museums, belief in a young earth came back with such a vengeance that today many American Christians simply assume the young earth position has been the Christian position for all of time. Today, there's a fierce battle among conservative Christians in America. Those who believe the earth is old accuse the other side of ignoring science. Those who believe the earth is young accuse the other side of compromising the authority of scripture. So what does the Bible actually say about the age of the earth? Who's right? If Genesis 1 says God created the universe from nothing in six days, who are we to say he didn't? Don't we respect the authority of scripture? We need to talk about how we interpret the Bible. We know that God didn't just give us the Bible on golden plates or drop finished copies from heaven right into Christian bookstores. He chose to work through human authors. So if we're looking for the authoritative message of God's word, we have to get at it through the human authors he used. This means we need to engage with their language. None of them wrote in English, after all. Their style of communication, figures of speech, and cultural understandings. Here's a very important point. The Bible was written for us, but not to us. This is kind of easy to grasp if you think about Paul's two letters to Timothy, 1st and 2nd Timothy. They are not Paul's two letters to Phil. I can benefit from them, but they were not written to me. They were written to Timothy. Paul's letters to the Thessalonians were written to the first century church in Thessalonica. And the book of Genesis was written by an ancient Israelite, to ancient Israelites. The more we know about Greek culture and what was going on around Timothy in his day, the easier it is to interpret the letters Paul wrote to him. In the same way, the more we know about how ancient Israelites thought and communicated, how they viewed the world, the more confidence we can have that we're not barking up the wrong tree while trying to interpret the message of their writing. Unfortunately, we don't have much writing from ancient Israelites other than what we have in the Bible itself. What we do have, though, as of quite recently, is a tremendous amount of writing from Israel's neighbors, from ancient Egyptians and Sumerians, Akkadians and Babylonians. We've only been able to read Egyptian hieroglyphics since about 1850 and Sumerian cuneiform since around 1900. And since then, scholars have discovered and translated more than a million documents written by Israel's neighbors. 
But how does this help us? The Israelites weren't Egyptian or Babylonian. No, but the Israelites were embedded in that world. Ancient Israelites thought and spoke much more like ancient Egyptians or Babylonians than like modern Americans. That in mind, a number of evangelical Bible scholars have jumped into the writings of Israel's ancient neighbors to gain insight into the thought and culture of the ancient Near East. Scholars like Daniel Kim at Talbot School of Theology and John Walton at Winton College have asked questions questions like, how did people of the ancient Near East think about creation? How did they think about existence? And how was their thinking different from ours today? And these scholars noticed some interesting things. For example, the creation stories of the ancient Near East, and almost every group had one, they don't start with nothing. They start with chaos, with an unordered world. The more scholars looked, the more clear it became that ancient Near Eastern people didn't think about creation in terms of material, dirt and rock and the elements of the periodic chart. They thought about creation in terms of order. Who brought order out of chaos so that humans could live and raise crops and grow families? And whoever it was, whichever god or gods, what does that tell us about our relationship with them? In other words, when ancient people thought about the creation of the world, they weren't as concerned with the what and the how. They were concerned with the who and the why. With our scientific materialist mindset today that went into hyperdrive with the scientific revolution at the time of Isaac Newton and, well, James Usher, when we think about creation, we immediately think about rocks and dirt and dinosaurs and butterflies, about the formation of mountains and forests and deserts. But that's not how ancient people thought. Christian scholars going back as far as Origen in the third century and Augustine in the fourth century have been confused by Genesis 1 and wondered, if this is the story of material creation, why is so little material being created? And how can we have day and night on day one and blossoming trees and plants on day three when there's no sun until day four? As we lay out the Bible's creation story alongside creation stories of Israel's neighbors, we notice differences and similarities. Like the creation stories of their neighbors, Genesis 1 doesn't start with nothing. It starts with God hovering over the waters. Primordial waters were a symbol of chaos in the ancient world. And what does God create on day one? What's the end product? Day and night. These aren't objects, that's not stuff. And day two, a separation between the waters below and the waters above. Nothing new is made, things that already exist are moved around. On day three, more separation of things that already exist. God separates water from land and then initiates a process for the benefit of humans, the production of food. Day four, lights to govern night and day and mark out seasons on a sacred calendar. Again, none of these are objects. The sun and stars wouldn't have been viewed as objects by the Israelites, just lights hung on the great vault of the sky. The more Kim and Walton and others compared Genesis 1 to examples of how Israel's neighbors thought about creation, the more something became clear. The people of the ancient Near East didn't think about creation in material terms. They thought about it in functional terms. Creation didn't start with nothing and give us dirt and oxygen and butterflies. It started with chaos or unordered space and gave us order. Unordered space was of no benefit to human society. Ordered space, functioning the way God intended, was considered good. Looking at Genesis 1 with an ancient Near Eastern mindset, the mindset the original author and audience would have shared, suddenly tells a different story and an ultimately more important story. On day one, God looked over the unordered deep and brought order in the form of time, day and night, the ordering of man's schedule of work and rest. On day two, God ordered the waters. Day three, he separates land from sea and establishes the process by which plant life reproduces and replenishes. Whereas early Christian thinkers had looked at the days of Genesis 1 and wondered what the heck was being created, and post-Reformation thinkers like Usher and Isaac Newton forced the Bible through a filter of the scientific revolution, looking through eyes shaped by the way the Israelites actually looked at the world, we see that the story the author is telling is a story about God bringing order out of chaos for the benefit of humankind an ordered, functioning space where God and humans could be in relationship. And then God creates men and women in his own image and gives us the job of working with him to extend order throughout the rest of his creation, to spread God's order and flourishing and beauty throughout the earth. 
So, if the creation story we find in Genesis 1 is actually about the creation of order and function rather than the elements of the periodic table, when did God create all the stuff? That isn't a question God inspires the author to answer because it isn't a question ancient Israelites would have been asking. Again, the story of creation the Israelites would have longed for isn't a story of what and how. It's a story of who and why. It's a theological story, not a scientific one. Who brought order out of chaos so human society could thrive? Why did they do it? And what does that mean for us? And this is where the creation story in Genesis differs from any other creation story of the ancient Near East. In most stories, a god or gods created humans so the humans could serve the gods. The gods had needs and humans had to meet them. But Israel's God tells a very different story. Israel's God doesn't need service from humans. Israel's God wants relationship with humans, wants to work alongside humans, walk with humans. It's an amazing story that would have inspired the Israelites to devote themselves joyfully to their creator. Does it tell us how old the earth is or when God created potassium? Uh, no, it does not. Is it possible God created all the material of the universe while he was ordering and inaugurating the functions? Yes, it's possible, but the Bible does not require it. The creation story God inspired that we find in Genesis isn't a story about modern science, biology, or geology. It isn't a story written to answer the materialist questions of modern Americans. It's way better than that. The God of Israel brought order out of chaos so he could be in relationship with you, so you could join in his project of bringing order and abundance and beauty to the whole world. Isn't that a better story? If you'd like to learn more, John Walton sat down with Sky Jatani to create a new four-part series on how to read Genesis 1, available only for Holy Post Plus subscribers. Head over to holypost.com Genesis to check it out.